Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom Powers. I am the programmer for Sundance Now's uh, Doc Club. Um, I encourage you to visit it at SundanceNow.com. Every month, I curate a uh, selection of documentaries under a theme. Um, and this month's theme, uh, the January theme, is Spotlight on Women Directors. And for that occasion, all right, we love women directors. Um, we want to uh, uh, assemble uh, a group of esteemed women directors uh, here today, and I'm going to introduce them to you shortly. Now, this idea was uh, partly inspired by uh, a gender diversity study that uh, Sundance Institute did last year, and there's a lot of uh, discussions that uh, arose from that. And one factor noted in the study is that women are, tend to be better represented in documentary film than they do in fiction, although it's still far from being equal. Um, it's also notable in the documentary field how many women occupy uh, real places of executive power. I think of Sheila Nevins at HBO or Molly Thompson at A&E, Carrie Putnam at the Sundance Institute, Tabitha Jackson of the Sundance Documentary Fund, uh, Kara Mertes at Ford Foundation. Um, but, uh, you know, but there are certainly, there are plenty of anecdotal things that you can point to that, uh, that show that we're far from uh, parity. You know, this year amongst the, uh, the Oscar doc nominees, despite very many uh, uh, great contenders uh, of films directed by women, there's only one female director in the five nominees. In my own curation at the Toronto International Film Festival, where I curate the documentary section, Every year, I can point to myself uh, that you know, there are many more men in that program uh, than women. And I think about uh, Francis Ford Coppola was at the Toronto Film Festival a few years ago, and someone asked him, what is your advice for a young filmmaker? And he said, well, my advice is different if I'm talking to a man or a woman. He said, if I'm talking to a man, my advice is start a family. Get married, start a family, because when I had a family, I felt, uh, I felt protected and solid, and I, it gave me something to want to work for. And he said, if I'm talking to a woman, I would say, put off starting a family uh, as long as possible because once you get married, you, you know, your husband is just going to be sponging off of you um, and it's going to slow you down. And, uh, you know, when I heard that, I was thinking, well, you know, maybe that is kind of advice that reflects his age. You, you know, if you read Peter Biskin's book, Easy Riders, Raging Bulls, about the 70s filmmakers, it's full of, you know, these strong male directors with uh, kind of, you know, supportive women. Uh, behind them. And in some ways, you know, things have changed uh, for the better uh, since then, but, it, you know, in many ways, uh, they, they haven't. And as, as I was preparing these remarks today, I was thinking about the, the great women pioneers of documentary. I think of Helen Levitt, who made In the Street in 1948, an absolutely groundbreaking documentary film that, uh, that really paved the way for, uh, for, for taking cameras out into the street or Shirley Clark, who made Portrait of Jason that, uh, that was recently uh, re-released, or Hope Ryden, you know, a name who's uh, you know, really unknown, but was a key figure of Drew Associates, along with uh, D.A. Pennebaker, Robert Drew, and Ricky Leacock in the early days in the 60s, or Joyce Chopra, who made Happy Mother's Day with Ricky Leacock, and Joyce at 34 in 1972, a, a real pioneering first-person film, or Agnes Varda, or Barbara Koppel, and we could go on and on uh, in that list. On, uh, I, I um, run a program in New York called Stranger Than Fiction. And I have a website called stfdocs.com. And earlier this week, I, I did a kind of alphabet of women directors uh, from the past year uh, that you can look up at stfdocs.com. And, and you know, I, I did an A through Z list of, um, of uh, you know, achievement of women behind the screen and, uh, and sometimes on the screen in documentary in the past year. And that list could, could get... Uh, you know, much longer. Uh, you know, still, I would mix feelings putting together a panel on women directors. Ideally, I'd like to think that a great director is a great director. And the positive side of curating this kind of collection is that, it, you know, that we can't ignore that a gender gap still, uh, still exists. The downside is the, bis uh, is the risk of being reductive. On stage, we have four great directors, period. Being a woman is one part of their, uh, one factor in their life, but there's many aspects of their backgrounds that they bring to their directing uh, choices. And I never see a panel of male directors being asked, you know, what it's like to be a man and, uh, and a director and how, how that influences them. So in this panel, we're going to try to avoid rehashing old, gro uh, old ground, um, and we've got a great collection of, of people here. Um, uh, starting off, we've got uh, Rory Kennedy. Uh, who's here at the festival with her film, Last Days of Vietnam. 
Uh, next to her is Lucy Walker, who last year was at the festival with her terrific film, The Crash Reel, and is back with a short, which Lucy remind me that. The Lion's Mouth Opens. The Lion's Mouth Opens uh, is her short. Uh, Next to Lucy is Judith Helfand, uh, one of the co-founders of Chicken and Egg, a uh, tremendous fund that supports women directors, also a great filmmaker in her own right. Her uh, uh, films at, uh, at uh, Sundance um, uh, include Blue Vinyl and uh, what's the... Uh, a healthy Baby Girl and uh, Everything's Cool. And Everything's Cool. She's Found currently it. working on a film called Cooked. Uh, next to uh, Judith is Shala Lynch. She was here in 2004. With her, for, with her film uh, Shirley Chisholm, 72, Unbought and Unbossed. Uh, her film last year was Free Angela and All Political Prisoners, which I had the privilege of showing the premiere at the Toronto Film Festival. And our moderator uh, today is Ann Thompson, who, uh, re re uh, who writes the must-read blog on uh, IndieWire, Thompson on Hollywood. She has a new book called The $11 Billion Year about uh, the year of 2012 in movies from Sundance to the Oscars, and I'm going to turn it over to Ann Thompson. Please welcome them. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Um, this is a great group of women, and I want to ask you how you feel, and we'll start with Rory, how you feel about um, being on a women's panel. As he suggested, is, does it, is, should we not be doing this? Um, you guys are going to have to excuse me because I, I have a Sundance voice at this point. Um, I, I love being on a panel with all these great women. This is awesome. And uh, I and this room full of fantastic looking women and a few men. Um, so, you know, I'm all for it. I think that it would be nice if it was an equal playing field, but it's not. And as I said yesterday on the panel, you know, we are dealing with a lot of sexism in Hollywood and in this industry, and I think we've got to get to the bottom of it and work through it and until we get to an equal playing field. we got to keep doing these panels. Lucy? Um, uh, Is this working? Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I, I actually just want to um, uh, salute Tom because um, there are certain people that really um, champion women filmmakers, and when he does lists of films, I just notice that women happen to be well represented on lists of good films of the year, or when he's curating his programs, and there are other lists, there was a couple of famous ones, Tom could remind me, I probably blocked them out, like famous documentaries, best documentaries ever, that are like 50 documentaries directed by men, and I think, I, there are some lists like that that I, I really um, get annoyed about. And, I, uh, and, and Tom is a true champion of women filmmakers. I'm really happy to be here. There is a lot to talk about. Some people say, oh, documentary and women is fine. It is a bit better than fiction film. And you could say that's for lots of reasons, some of which probably include that there's a lot of people not getting paid and working insanely hard um, <laughs> on causes that they're really passionate about and, uh, and nobody had to give them permission or fund them up front to do. So there's lots of reasons you could sort of talk about why it, documentaries are definitely friendlier to women and, and that's definitely why uh, my career has been in documentary. Um, I'm actually, by the way, a totally failed fiction filmmaker um, uh, uh, and, and documentaries have been where I've gotten to work at all. Um, but uh, I also think it, it is true that at the awards level, women are less represented. It's definitely not 50-50. And it's less, at, and, and also um, at the how much we get paid level, women don't get paid, I think, um, in the same way that men do, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots to talk about, and I think that's really good to be having the conversation. Judith? <coughs> Well, <clears throat> I co-founded a fund that's specifically focused on supporting women filmmakers like my and women film. directors. Like her film. Um, so I do this all the time. So um, I'm actually I'm thrilled that we're doing it. I think it's, I think it's great. And I also want to give a shout out to Tom. Um, we've been collaborating with Tom for years. And he's been supporting us having all female um, panels for the most part for the, like, the last four years um, at Doc NYC, which is an, and we've been using that as a model at other film festivals, um, and it's been a very very important platform for us. So I echo what everyone said. I think it's. I'm I glad was to a little worried. I was a little worried, not because I didn't want to chat with these wonderful, fabulous directors, but I didn't want it to be a wah 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 session. Sometimes these panels can go that way, and I think um, in order to make a film, you have to. Um, well, as a director, you have in docs particularly, you have to be a good producer, and that's knowing the pitfalls that are ahead of you and knowing what your Achilles' heel will be. 
So I am a woman and I am black and I tell stories about women who are often black. And so when I'm talking about pitching and fundraising, I have to know that in order to sell and the stories. Um, and so these are things we should talk about and we should know how to deal with. They're not gonna change that fast. And I would also like to say that I'm, also, I'm part of the Women's um, Filmmaker Initiative this year, one of six filmmakers, um, and there are those kinds of things are really helpful because sometimes when you come to a subject, like I happened upon filmmaking. I never set out to be a filmmaker. So I didn't have the network um, to draw upon. And so some of these initiatives where you're mentored and you have access and people help you set up meetings are instrumental because this is a business <laughs> and you got to know the players in the business. And so when Sundance introduces you to somebody, you, you actually get a chance to talk to them. Well, let's look ahead a, a bit and say, what needs to change? I mean, a, as far as you've been able to figure out, um, given your own experience and, and the various pitfalls you've encountered, where is the progress going to take place? Anyone? I, I was just came from the Women in Film Breakfast here. And there's a real engine of research, getting hard statistics. And one that's a really good place. I really support Sundance. Um, uh, led by Kerry Putnam, but there's a whole group of women at Sundance um, that are doing this great research, Stacey Smith at uh, USC, uh, to try and really um, get into it. And there's some great stuff that they've identified about, uh, Judith can talk, I'm sure, about it, which is um, identifying some, some of the roadblocks. For example, um, uh, one of the things might be women may have uh, be less good at asking for money or you know some of the things that seem to be identifying those roadblocks and and designing strategies to specifically address them and I think I just want to thank Sundance um, if anybody from Sundance is listening or you should know that they have a real engine I have really felt uh, some of the research that they've been pushing out has been resulting in a lot of the press attention about why women are so underrepresented in our industry because the statistics are a scandal I mean let's just go back to four percent of Hollywood films directed by women down from eight percent a few years ago it's a scandal I, um, I think that you know part of what they're identifying and I think you know even in the film schools you know a lot of the film schools they'll start out 50 50 um, women want to be directors they want to be producers they want to be very serious craftspeople but from a directing producing level particularly directors by the time they're there either you know at the end of their master's program or certainly at the end of their uh, end of their undergraduate program there's like a huge, huge, huge drop. So, I mean, you could sort of look at the culture of competition, not that competition's a bad thing, but particularly in a school atmosphere, there is probably a way to be able to say we can create an incredible spirit where um, collaboration trumps competition. And if we know these statistics, we could create some interventions ahead of time to make sure that that doesn't happen. And I think in, in terms of, um, what's going on with the Sundance Women's Initiative, you know, and this morning, there's lots of organizations around the country. And what I think what lots of us are trying to do is to kind of be, you know, sort of like an underground railroad, like an above ground railroad. I'm, I'm just riffing on the conversation we just had about our new project. <laughs> and to sort of figure out, like, where are all the pitfalls? You know, if, if it's really hard to make your second project after you've made your first great one because it actually was totally unsustainable and you didn't get paid and all these people did stuff for free and you come out of the festival circuit and you're a great ingenue and it's terrific and now you actually have to get into the business and it's really hard, then that's where all these different institutions have to put their focus on helping that woman make her next piece. And all of us have to actually collaborate and kind of pass the baton in terms of support and create a very serious kind of girls network. It, it, is, it is kind of odd because I think we all get into it because we're passionate about a certain subject and the content. And then you really are faced with the business. And I think women thrive in the documentary film business because the budgets are smaller. Um, they're typically under a million dollars. And in the narrative world, on the kind of commercial side, I mean, not commercial side, but on the kind of investor side, it's do I have confidence in this person to administer $10 million, $20 million? And that's kind of where the stereotypes kick in sometimes, where you'll see guys that have had made a commercial or you know done a short, and all of a sudden, they're like heading a $20 million action movie. Well, we can do that too, you know? <laughs> well, a lot of it is perception, isn't it, Rory? Yeah. Were you going to say something? Uh, well, I was just going to add, I'm, I'm making a, a, participating in a series on PBS called Makers, which is, uh, it started as a, a 
a historical documentary about the women's <coughs> rights movement. It's expanding to a six-part series. So I'm producing two segments of that, one on women in politics and one on women in Hollywood. And so, you know, we've been thinking about these issues a lot. And, you know, Lucy's right with the, the statistics are really grim. You know, 16% women in Hollywood have major positions in the top 250 grossing films. And in the top 4% grossing films, it's much lower than, the, I mean, yeah, the top 5% gro grossing films, it's like 4%. So it's very grim. And even in documentaries, I think, um, like in the last 10 years, even at Sundance, uh, I think 34% of the directors of documentaries here have been women. You know, and this you feel like is a very progressive place. It really supports women and focuses on women, but still, you know, there's still limitations within our field as well. So there are a lot of challenges. And, you know, what I've found in the Hollywood film in particular is that the, the, where you see the breakthrough is where you see women who are, have, have some moxie and audacity and charge ahead. And you know, it's sort of that whole idea of leaning in, which I, I recommend everybody here reads. I think it's a fantastic book, but you know, it's a sense of we're, we're kind of, the women are comfortable on the sidelines, they're comfortable sort of, they don't want to ask for a check, you know, more money. Men are much more comfortable, they're much more assertive in these ways. And so it has to do with our larger culture and what we've internalized as women. And breaking through that as what, you know, it's that coupled with an industry that is in fact, you know, much more oriented towards men, comfortable with men, is it, it's, a, it's a men's world to some degree. And so, you know, in order to get into it, we have to, you know, our generation, people who are on the brink of that have to be more assertive and we gotta jump in the mix, you know. And I think, uh, uh, just to add to that, I think an important part is having allies. Yeah. And I think sometimes as women, we, I, I know, I'll speak for myself, like I'll work like, with my, in my own little silo, and I forget that there are people to talk to, there are people who are part of networks that you can draw on. And so one of the things that's been interesting about this Sundance Initiative is that it's reminding you, it's reminded me about how many people I actually do know and how much I'm not taking advantage of that, which is more of a girl thing than I think it is a boy thing. But, but it is networks, that you can't do it all alone. You have to have allies. So what, what are examples of, of movies where you faced some kind of adversity that you managed to get past um, as a woman, where, where, you, where you got caught in a, in, a, in a situation where you felt some, some sexism and some, some obstacles? Uh, or where you proved that you, you, were, you had to prove yourself in a way that you, didn't, you shouldn't have had to? Rory? Well, I, I don't know that if this is a good example, but I did do a series with a network who, um, it was it was a, a large a ten part series, and I remember being in the boardroom, and they, we were talking about a narrator and who we could choose for a narrator, and um, they said, oh yeah, we're open to using narrator. You can really use anybody in any field. You know, we're really open to anything, but of course it has to be a man. And and so you know everybody sort of accepted that, and like a minute later I was like. Excuse me, I'm sorry, why does it have to be a man? <laughs> and, and you know, well, that's like the voice of God, you know, that's what people trust. I was like, wait a second, <laughs> wait, excuse me, wait a second. So, you know, you, I mean, you, you do come across these, these moments where it, uh, you know, it's very apparent. But I think in the documentary world, I mean, you know, almost all the executives I've worked with are women and, you know, they've been very supportive of me as a woman. Although I do think if you look at who their bosses are, they're all men. And that becomes a factor in and of itself. Well, Lucy, you had to go up uh, Mount Everest with an all-male crew. I mean, what was that like? That was so awful. Yeah, that was, I had a difficult time. Um, and I would say one of the things I love about being a bit uh, more experienced is that um, I think it's easier for people to have confidence in me. Something I really noticed when I was younger is that some people just didn't have confidence in me. They'd look at me and I could just tell they didn't think I was a very good director. And usually that was unspoken, although on Everest, some of these mountaineers really actually just said it out loud, like, what are you doing directing this movie? Because it's a very sexist culture, mountaineer culture. And I'd only done one film at that point and they couldn't understand why I was directing this film about climbing Mount Everest. 
and there were many times at which I couldn't figure it out either. And it was really um, that. Oh, that was my film Blind Side, which premiered at, at Toronto. And um, so I really like now that I feel like I can. Uh, people have more confidence in me. People, it's it's harder for people to look at me and think, oh my God, this incompetent woman, <laughs> um, because I have a track record. Um, gosh, lots of examples. I had a hilarious example in Japan of just super sexist corporate culture. But I think it's, um, gosh, I, I know you, everyone else should talk for a bit. There's too many examples to even think of one. Um, I think, well, I th I'm going to invert it just a little bit. I mean, I think that the Vinyl Institute and the Chemical Institute and sort of all of these trade associations we're sort of like, what is this middle class Jewish girl from New York doing questioning you know, the vinyl industry? So on one level, they just thought like, get rid of her, like figure out a way to get rid of her. And th they were sort of spying on me and they were like, uh-oh, she's gonna play the cancer card. She doesn't have a uterus. She might make people feel bad. I mean, it's like in print, she might use her emotions. And they were really upset, they were scared about that. Um, and, and, and basically, I kind of like, I. I sort of used that, and I used the fact that I was like a nice middle-class Jewish girl from Merrick, Long Island, and was using this little middle-class starter ranch with vinyl on it to sort of usurp them. And in the end, I mean, it really worked. And I really couldn't sort of, I couldn't play their game the way that um, I think a man might, but I was actually much more effective because I used the tools of the trade and it was all about being transparent as a documentary filmmaker and just being transparent about their power and their, um, the way that they used it and the way they abused it and their crazy questions. And in the end, they looked, you know, they, they looked the way that they are. And, um, and, the, and the movie really did undo them on some level and has really transformed to some extent, the, the vinyl industry and certainly parts of the plastic industry. But I think I didn't try to like, I leaned in by kind of like, leaning back. by leaning back and being <laughs> chill and asking really dumb questions and kind of being like the dumb girl, but really not. Yeah, I, yeah, I was gonna say, so I made a film about Angela Davis and you know, she's a radical activist from the 70s who's probably best known for her afro. Um, and I was pitching um, and I had a really hard time raising the money. It took eight years to make primarily because people were afraid of her radicalism and it's a political story and I wanted to tell it as an action thriller and a documentary. <laughs> um, but I had this one meeting with an executive and I did my pitch, action thriller, et cetera, et cetera. And he, at the end of it, was said to me, so let me get this straight. Um, everybody you're going to interview is a senior citizen? <laughs> now, that is not the lens in which I see Angela Davis. <laughs> and so I think that we bump up against that kind of, right, we have, to, we, have to, we have to kind of move the, shift the camera lens for the people that we're talking to sometimes. So it's very difficult to raise the money. Ford Foundation came in. Um, and then I was able to forge a relationship in France with French producers. And a third of the budget came from France. Then I was able to come back. And all of a sudden, people were like, wow, this sounds like a great idea. And BET Networks, of all places, came in and put up the rest, half the budget to finish it. So. Sometimes, the point is that sometimes we use these things that are, that are our obstacles, and we have to be strategic about figuring out how to use it to our advantage in some way. So Rory, working on the last days of Vietnam, that was like an all-male military universe that might have seemed a strange one for you to enter. Yeah, it, I was very aware of it because um, all, yeah, all of my films have had women in them, and usually they, you know, are really focused on women. And so it was, it was a, a different world for me. Um, and, and in fact, I tried to find some women who we could profile who kind of w were, you know, within the same realm that we were working with. But unfortunately, there were some stories of women and some great stories of women, but they weren't in our exact time frame. So they didn't kind of work with the narrative as as we had created it in the film. Um, <coughs> so I, I, you know, I it was an all male crew, cast rather. Um, I, but I, I, you know, I rather enjoyed it. There's an an, an extraordinary uh, sequence. Perhaps you could talk about it, uh, where um, there's a helicopter that is hovering over this uh, ship and uh, they can't land, and, and what happens there? Yeah, so um, it, it, 
part of the film is, you know, it's about the last days of Saigon and it gets very hectic and, um, and it falls much quicker than the Americans think it will. And so the Americans don't put a policy in place and they basically decide at the end of the day that we just can get Americans out of, out of Saigon. And um, what happens is there are a lot of people on the ground who have good friends who are Vietnamese, who they know are going to be vulnerable to be being killed or tortured if they're left behind. So Americans on the ground took it in their own hands to save thousands upon thousands of Vietnamese in, that, in those last days, and particularly the last 24 hours. One of the stories we profile is a ship called the USS Kirk, which was protecting the fleet which was in South China Sea, so that when the helicopters were going from the embassy and the airport taking people out, if there was any attack on them, they could fire, fire on them. So when, as all of these US helicopters are leaving, the South Vietnamese, who were helicopter pilots, see them leave, and they're not gonna be left behind, so they get in their own helicopters and they fill them to the gill with their Vietnamese families, and they start following the US helicopters out to sea, but they don't have enough gas to get back home, and they don't know where they're going, and they don't have a plan. They're just following them. So this ship called the US Kirk is there, and these small Huey helicopters start hovering over them. They have no idea who they are, and the captain takes the bold move, of calling the first one down, lands on a ship, and they all get out, and there's these South Vietnamese, and they're all grateful. They don't have enough room on their deck to have more than one helicopter. So he says, well, what do we do? The crew says, what do we do? And the captain says, throw the helicopter overboard. Make room for the next one. And you see the next helicopter come down, the next one, the next one. But then what happens is a, a gigantic Chinook helicopter comes out, and the, the, the ship is not equipped to land a Chinook because, you know, it's the double propeller and this thing's got a big pole in the middle of the ship and it would destroy the entire ship. So they wave the guy away and they say, you can't land, you can't land. But he doesn't have enough gas to get to another ship or, or back. And he has five of his children on the Chinook, including an eight-month-old, a two-year-old, a five-year-old, a seven- and a nine-year-old. So the, sh the, the ship is going through the sea and the Chinook s hovers above the ship, and he opens the door, and he throws one of his kids down on deck, and they have no idea because they're not communicating. They just see this thing coming out, and they catch it, and it's a child. And then he throws the you know, 10-year-old, the 9-year-old, the 5-year-old, the, then finally the 8-month-old is thrown over deck, and the crew catches it. They throw everybody out. And then, the, and we have footage of all of this, which is amazing. But and then you must the, see this. Uh, and then the, the pilot then takes the, sh the the Chinook like a 50 yards off to the starboard side of the boat, and he has a flight suit on, and he which he undoes, which is apparently a really like act of insanity because he's you know he's got he's got to steer both propellers and take his suit off, and then he leans the helicopter over to the right and he jumps out the left door and the helicopter goes exploding, hits the water, explodes, he hits the water, disappears and this is all, you know, shot and footage of it and then 30 seconds later the guy pops up and the ship goes nuts and they're all screaming and yelling and they go <laughs> and they save him and it's really a beautiful moment. Thank you. <laughs> So Lucy, talk about the short that you brought here and why shorts are an important part of the process for do some documentary filmmakers. I just want to say, it's an, I saw the film, it was electrifying. Yeah, it that is. scene is electrifying. And uh, it's true. So I'm here with a See, short... so supportive of each other. Yes. Uh, I am here with a short film, only 15 minutes long. It's my shortest film I've ever had here. I've had six films here. This is my shortest, called The Lion's Mouth Opens. And um, that title actually comes from a Bob Dylan poem about Woody Guthrie who had a disease called Huntington's disease and Huntington's disease is a very um, scary disease that you could sort of describe as Parkinson's plus Alzheimer's it takes your body and your mind and you can get a gene test to find out if you have it and also what age the symptoms will begin and it's obviously a decision about whether to get the test and um, it's a very daunting 
uh, prognosis. Um, the film began when an amazing young woman who's also an actor, director, who's had a film here called Good Dick, and uh, she was the only female in the US dramatic competition when she had a film here. Um, this amazing uh, young woman just called me up and I was driving my car with my headset on and she said, I, I, I'm, I'm going through something and I think it might be worth documenting and I just had a feeling to call you up. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm so busy. I can't possibly do anything, but I'd love to help. So just explain what's going on a bit and I'll see if I can think of some people to help you. And she said, well, my dad has Huntington's disease and uh, if a parent has Huntington's disease, you have a 50-50 chance, a 50% chance of having it yourself. And you can get a test, and I want to get the test, and I think it would be important to document it because I'm a Huntington's Disease Society spokesperson, and this disease is so horrible that nobody talks about it. And it would be really helpful um, if we could make a little film about myself going through the testing. And I immediately said, oh my God, of course I'll help you. I'll do anything. She's also the most charming person ever. So I couldn't possibly, you know, not do this. And um, I was so inspired and we met and she's so incredible on camera. I just knew um, that it would be a gift to everyone with Huntington's disease um, if we could make this film. And also, I just wanted to make the film as a gift to her because sometimes when people are going through very difficult times, I think it can be a real sense of purpose to, um, have the camera around. So um, I just made it, and at the back of my mind, the amazing Judith uh, had said to me, um, because I'd applied for a chicken and egg grant for my last film, The Crash Reel, but I applied kind of late and I made the film kind of quickly. And it was kind of at the end of the process when she came through and she said, we, I love you, I want to give you a grant. It wasn't but me, it was all of the, the chicken and egg, sorry. But you were the one that called me up and said, uh, we'd love to give you a grant, but hey, we'd like to come in a bit earlier and you're finishing the film. Why don't we come in early on your very next project? So at the back of my mind, I was thinking, oh, I can go to Chicken and Egg and get funding if this sort of turns into a project. But at this stage, I didn't even know what was going to happen. I just wanted to be there for my amazing friend and start filming immediately. And I could do that and just pay for it out of my own pocket because at the back of my mind was Judith saying, I believe in you. We're going to cover whatever the you name think. Of our grant. It's the I Believe in You grant. And it's exactly what it felt like. And I just thought, well, if I think this is worth filming, I've, I know Chicken and Egg has got my back. And we just jumped in and made this film that's very intense, 15 minute film about Mariana and her amazing friend group as they support her going through to get her test results. Um, so. And, what, wh and, why, and how do you figure out what's a long film and what's a short film? And why do short films help with the long film? My answer to how long a film should be is. Uh, 15 seconds short of boring. I just don't ever think you should bore people. I see features sometimes and I wish they were short. And I don't think, I think a film has to be really good and there has to be a lot of story before um, people can sustain it as a feature. And I just don't want to waste, life is short. And you know, why, you know, you want the film to be as, as short as possible, to be as good as possible. And I like short. I think short is the new long. I think there are new and exciting opportunities for shorts, and there's some great short you documentaries. Short is the new long. I did. I, I agree. I agree. And there's some great short work, and um, it's interesting. There are not many veteran filmmakers doing doc shorts, um, whereas I think in fiction there are quite a few people that still do really good shorts. So, um, but I, it's interesting being in the doc shorts program here. I tend to feel a little old lady and experienced uh, in the mix. But I think people should because it keeps your muscles sharp. For a story like this, it was perfect. It's a, and there was a, a beautiful write-up in the LA Times saying why, um, you know, when a short film is better than a feature film. And I was so happy with that because, um, you know, stories come in all different ways and films come in all different ways. And the more I do, the more I learn. And this story is electrifying at 15 minutes and I didn't want to dilute that. Um, and we might go on to make a, fix, a, a, sorry, a feature. Uh, it would be exciting to do that. And this is maybe the first step in that journey. I think we will go ahead and do that because we're so excited about how well the shorts come out. But um, th this is, you know, this is 15 minutes and um, the LA Times called an espresso shot to the heart. And I love that, <laughs> you know. Sometimes that's just what you want, <laughs> right? So picking film subjects is, is the key to what you all do. Um, and, and tell me how you make that decision. I mean, how, how do you decide that a movie is actually warranting a feature? 
for, for me, it's when um, I do the research, I have an idea and I do the research and the hair on the back of my neck tingles. And when I talk about it, people comment about how passionate or elect electrifying is a good word. I might <laughs> there that you can convey the story very well because you have to live with it for a long time. I mean, most films um, it takes a number of years, and so do you want to do you want to live with this subject? Do you want to have it be in your life when you're constantly doing everything? Because they, they kind of, it invades like a, like a virus. I would say <laughs> you know that it, what we do <laughs> it takes over your life and your brain. It was fine. I'm looking at the hashtag own your story, which I think is um, great. I mean, I think um, I think it takes a while to sort of figure it out. For me, it takes me at a certain point, I have to start explaining it to somebody. And when um, I have a really good title um, and I explain it to someone and I could sort of see the light go on in their eyes and something happens, I feel like, OK, I, I think I could do this. I mean, the, the movie that I'm working on now, I started in 2004. So it's a very, very long film. I'm, I just, today I coined the term the, the, the slow film movement, kind of like slow food movement. Um, and, I and by the time I finish this, which God willing is going to be next year, I mean, it's a very, very, very different film than the one I started. So, you know, if, if um, Katrina hadn't happened, I would have only made a film about one of the worst heat waves um, in U.S. history when, you know, um, 739 um, mostly poor, mostly African American, and mostly elderly people died in one city, mostly on the south and west sides of Chicago, in a week, which is extraordinary. And, the, you know, the day that I finished the trailer, Katrina hit, and all of a sudden there was another horrible, um, you know, disaster. And all of a sudden, we were kind of looking at the underside of America. And it was clearly, like, on, on some level, the real story was acute disparity, not just an, an extreme disparity, not just extreme weather. So then I started to do that. But I'm also a field builder, and I was making um, Chicken and Egg launched in 2005. So, so Everything's Cool is, is the one you were just talking about? No, it's cooked. Cooked. So, yeah, I, you know, I was in the midst of making this movie <laughs> called Everything's Cool when I realized we weren't dealing with cities and the urban experience, and it led me to that. But now it's sort of become a story about the politics of disaster, and that's what happens. You know, time marches on, and your stories take on very new meaning, and the world changes. I would just like to add to that. You know, sometimes we get attracted to a subject, and that's not the same as a story. Right. That what you're searching for is how to, how to find the story, how to convey it in a way that, that does captivate your audience. Um, and I think that's a really good distinction to make. You changed gears on the tsunami and the cherry blossom, as I recall. Um, I, actually, I, I sort of, uh, well, the stories on that was that um, I had originally intended to make a very short film, a little haiku, a film haiku, I called it, like a maybe two minute film or five minute film about cherry blossom um, uh, because I was going there for a press junket. Uh, for my film Counter to Zero, and I felt like I needed a bit of cheering up because talking about nuclear weapons in Japan is really, really heavy, and um, and I was really excited about cherry blossoms. So, um, so that was just my little dream personal plan, and I put that plan to action on March third, twenty eleven, twenty eleven, and um, so I planned it all out, and then March eleventh, two thousand eleven, the tsunami happened. And uh, my first thought was, oh my God, I can't go to Japan now because everyone's evacuating. And then my second thought was like, oh my God, if I was ever gonna make a film about cherry blossom in Japan, which is all about transience and fragility of life and Japanese culture, my God, now is the cherry, what is cherry blossom season gonna be like this year? Ah, uh, I've gotta go. Uh. And even the night before I called up my wonderful DP, who was my only crew, and I said, oh my God, it's the stupidest thing ever. I'm so sorry, of course we shouldn't be doing this. I'm so sorry. Oh, what a bad idea. Uh. And um, he just said, don't worry, Lucy, you always get cold feet. It's just the cold feet. Don't worry, it'll be fine. And, and, um, and, and so we went ahead and, and did it. And that was a short film, actually, that was 40 minutes. The economics of short films aren't great, I would say. I owe $30,000 on that movie, even though it got nominated for the Academy Award, won the best short film here, and I sold it to HBO for that top whack. I, I didn't pay myself, I did not pay myself. I actually owe $30,000 on that film, and it couldn't have been made any cheaper. Like, you couldn't, like, I don't know. I paid the DP, I paid the editor, like, I, I didn't, it wasn't like, well, you know what I mean? Like, it was, there was no, I didn't buy a warm jacket. I mean, it was like, it was no, it was so bare bones. So the, the economics of short films are, are grotesque, which is where the 
chicken and egg grant is so fabulous um, for this new short film of mine. Um, but um, so I will say that. But I think they're a vital and wonderful medium that I seem to have um, a real uh, uh, pleasure in making. I think it's really, really, I really like just the, for the filmmaking of it all. Uh, and though a 50 minute film is significant, it's not like it's a five minute film. And so that I think sometimes people, uh, uh, you know, think that that's a TV hour, that's sellable. 40 is actually 40. Yes, 40. 40. We, did make, we yes. later made a 53, which. Right. Um, so that there we are. We should have ways. sold more, but we actually, the 40 minute has sold better, weirdly, than the 53. So, Rory, did you want to talk about how you choose stories? Um, sure. I, uh, you know, I think I agree with everybody on the panel that. You give so much to these films, and y you have to be passionate about it. I would just add, you know, sometimes it's a story, sometimes it's an issue, and then you try to find the story, as you said, for me. Or, um, you know, sometimes uh, I work a lot with HBO, and you know, now with the American Experience, sometimes they'll approach me and ask me to do a project, and that's always nice. You know, if it's something I'm interested in, like the last days in Vietnam, it wouldn't have been something I necessarily would have come to on my own, but I was interested in the story, and then when I, you know, started doing the research and found all these dramatic stories within that, and, and um, you know, I got more and more excited about it, but I would say there is something to be said for a project that's financed and has distribution and comes your way, so, you know, because otherwise uh, so much of us spend our time fundraising and not filmmaking, um, so there's an appeal to that, so, you know, I think there's for me often an, an um, consideration of both what I'm excited about and also what I think you know HBO might like and where where the convergence is between my interest and sort of the marketplace. Judith, did you want to add to that? You know what, I just wanted to flag that I have something I want to say at the end of all this. Go ahead. Oh, no, but it's not, it's sort of an ending thing. I was going to say, I was going to say, I think, I just, just I, I agree with all this stuff, and it's, for me, it's when, it's a, it's a combination of things, it's what's going to make a great film, is the first, the only thing, is what's going to be, what's, an, what's something that I'm so interested in that I can't let drop, what's the question that I would, you know, destroy two years, or two years of my life to make, because it does. And then sometimes there are subjects that you don't want to make, but they nag you. The images you are there. Stop, yeah. You just can't stop talking about it or thinking yeah, and it about gets, it. And the more you turn and it over, your mind it becomes it gets this obsessive, compulsive thing that yeah. it would be easier to make the film to give you some peace than it would be not to. Free yeah. Angela and I'll I feel like first I first. do. I sort of, the film, sometimes people will say, well, what do you think about this? I'm like, well, I made the film. The film is the simplest possible answer to what I think about it. And I'm a filmmaker and I express myself filmically and the answer is the film. Um, and if, if it gets more interesting, because sometimes you have ideas, I have lots of ideas, and when I turn them over in my brain, you think, ah, oh, somebody else did something similar. Ah, oh, it's gonna be really impossible to get access. Ah, oh, there's no good footage. You know, if it gets, ah, oh, you know, actually it's kind of a bit obvious, it's a bit boring, it seems interesting, but if you really think about it, there's not, doesn't get that much more interesting. Whereas other subjects, for example, my friend, my film Crash Roll, I just met Kevin Pierce, this amazing snowboarder with a brain injury. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, wow, action sports, these kids, are they being exploited because they're dying and people are making money? Wow, what's it like to have a brother with Down syndrome, uh, d intellectual disability from birth with a brother with, you know, so every time I thought about it, I thought, oh my God, that's interesting. Oh my God, that's interesting. Oh my God, he wants to get back to snowboarding and he might die because the doctors are telling me not to. Wow, I want to follow that. Oh, there's all this footage and it's really cinematic and nobody's done a film at all. So the more you think about it, the more opportunities you see to make a good film. And I'm all about the film. I'm just going to say one thing. A lot of people have the ideas, this idea, you've distinction you've drawn between the story and the subject. And I'm all about the story. I have to say, I made one film that's more of a topic-driven film, Counter to Zero. And as a filmmaker, I love the stories. They're so much easier to make for me. The topics are really hard. The topics are hard to shoot. They're hard to, they're hard to tell. They're, they're hard to edit, because where do you start, right? The narrative Whereas, arc. Where are you? Yeah. <laughs> it's I'm a topic. Because I'm, yeah. I'm in the yeah. sub-theme to this whole week is failure. And I'm like, I'm like, you're not failing, you're in process. So I'm listening, shaking my head. No, I find it for those topic films really um, keep me awake at night. Whereas a story film, it's like actually, um, 
there's a story and you know what's important and you film it and then you put it together in sequence. It's stuff like that. It's the edit of Wasteland, for example. We just, we didn't have very long, so we just put the scenes in chronological order on the, we, I do index court cards on a notice board. Wasteland's edit, chronological order. With a, the first index card says poetic intro. The last one says poetic outro. <laughs> It's chronological order. If ever there was like six characters all look at their portraits at once, montage. I mean, that was it. We did it. They edited that thing in eight weeks flat. Sounds Give like a Give me narrative. a topic and like, you know, check back in a couple of years. <laughs> and uh, it's terrible, right? It's really hard. So that's just warn people the topic is films yeah, really hard. But I think the thing that binds everyone's films together, I mean, is that they, everyone has really struggled, strived and triumphed at times of finding their own unique voice. And even, you know, you might have some films that don't quite feel like you or it was a work for hire, but I mean, and maybe it's not like the film that you love the most, but I think for all of you, I mean, the, and it's for all of you, you know, who are struggling to do this and striving to do this or triumphing, I hope, you know, when you find your own unique voice, that's really, really critical and that's what everyone responds to. That's what the industry responds to, that's what the festival programmers respond to, that's what Anne responds to, is when, you know, you could take the story, but I mean, lots of people are making films about extreme sports, but you were able to kind of go for the family mm -hmm. and find this very incredibly unique way of telling that, that I think really sets that apart. And I think the sh what's great about shorts is that, um, it's, a, it's really a great way to sort of enter this world and the stakes are a little lower and you could experiment. And I think the only way that you find your voice is by experimenting and not following a cookie cutter and being willing to make mistakes and fail forward and to experiment and do that is the greatest gift you could give yourself. Couldn't agree more. Um, uh, but the thing that strikes me about all of you too and, and what is often true of successful filmmakers is that you push harder. You go further. You don't settle for that almost very good movie. You wanna talk about a moment where you did that, each of you? I'd like to know. I'm a pain in the ass. I would say making bad stuff is so much easier. It's like, oh, that's great. But actually making it great, like, that's actually a real pain in the ass. I'm a super pain in the ass to work with. I'm like, I wanna make it good. That's so much more, that's so much more hard, right? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it is hard, and I would, you know, I, I would say I've been doing this now for 15 or 20 years, and every film is really, really hard. It's really, really hard to make a film, and it's really, really hard to make a great film, and, you know, there's no formula to it that I've figured out, and you have to, you know, bring, there's always new challenges and, and new breakthroughs, and it's, I, I think it's why we all love it so much, because you, every film, you learn so much about yourself and about a topic and a, about filmmaking and you know it's an extraordinary gift to be doing this kind of work and have the level of challenge and feel like you're working on all cylinders you know it's a, it's a huge privilege um, but I, I, I do think that there are moments in the process of filmmaking some, some where you have to um, stand your line and sometimes they're big moments and sometimes they're small moments um, on the Angela Davis movie, we, a third of the budget came from France, so Post was in France, and I thought that's the easiest way to deal with the language barrier, right? And so that meant that the, the audio mix was in France. And so the guy who was hired to do the audio mix um, was, you know, a typical French guy. He was like, this is the way it goes, blah, 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 da, da, da. And I listened to the film, and everybody was talking like this. Everybody, blah, blah, blah. And I said to him, no, no, yeah. no, no. This is, I, all the interviews were done at tables so that you could be intimate. It is as though you were having a conversation with something. The, the warmth it was supposed to be there. It took us a week to communicate. And what he realized is, finally, he said, you're right, Shala, you know, um, French is a guttural language. We talk like this. So when I mix this sound, I mix it high so that it can be like this. <laughs> you Americans <laughs> have a lot more high notes in your voice. So when I mixed it high, it sounded awful. And he went back and he remixed the movie and it sounded gorgeous. But one, he was trying to tell me, the director, that I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and two, he wasn't listening to my words, <laughs> which is what I say to my toddlers all the time. Listen to my words. <laughs> is there a moment for? Oh, there's always. I mean, I'm yeah. in the middle of the moment. So as I said to Tom, I was like, wow, you have like a movie from like the near past. You have these movies in the present, and then you have my movie. It's in the future, and um, and it's called Cooked, and it's uncooked right now, and um, it's painful. Cooking. What's that? 
cooking. It's cooking. It's simmering. It's simmering. I mean, I, I had to put it on the back burner this summer because my mom passed, and I, I just had to. But it's it's terrifying. Um, and right now, you know, I kind of have to stand my ground and say, sorry, it's not good enough. No, um, actually, I know just because I shot hundreds and hundreds of hours over many, many years and spent lots of money that all these extraordinary foundations have entrusted me with, it might not be there. I mean, some of it might not be there. I might have to scrap something. I'm gonna, I mean, I, you really have to be willing to fail. I mean, not once it gets to the end. Like, no, once it gets on the screen, you can't do that. But you have to fail in the middle, and you have to sort of throw it up. And you need some really safe spaces, and you need extraordinary colleagues, and you need to not be embarrassed just because you've been successful, quote unquote, in the past. You need to not be embarrassed and like let them see your rough cut and let them say, it sucks, Judith, or don't worry, or this part's good, or I hear your voice, and trust that I'm not making film by committee, but sometimes you need that extra support, and we give that to each other. I, and I think sometimes we forget our name goes on it, and you're only as good as your last project. And so you can't stand there and go, well, if only I had you know, negotiated with the sound guy, or if only I had edited three more months, all of those things. The work really has to stand for itself, that it is your voice. Um, and I, I've seen colleagues that are like, oh, I just needed to finish it and it goes out there and it, it doesn't do what they want it to do. Your name goes on it. You're gonna be criticized no matter what. You <laughs> have to love your work. <laughs> you do, but you also have to sometimes oh, choose, which to, you know, choose which hills to die on. And there's yes. a wisdom, sometimes discretion is the better part of valor and sometimes knowing when to fold a hand um, is knowing when to fold a hand and you live to fight another day. And not all films, I, I, I've talked to, to a lot of friends of mine recently whose films aren't coming out rosy, you know, or they're not, you know, the story just isn't developed or the access gets closed down. I mean, we, it's a, it, we, we, we're on the edge. It's a risk. It's a privilege, but it's a risk. This is real life and there's things we can't control and sometimes things, you know, you, you, you know, there's a beauty in the uniqueness. We're not manufacturing, you know, refrigerators where you perfect a production process. We are on the edge, you know, trying to tell unique stories every, Rory's exactly right. Every every process is unique, and thank goodness there's a lot of craft, and we learn, and lots of things get easier. And yet, every project has new curveballs, and some of them are not surmountable. So, as the industry has shifted, you guys have all been around for for a long time. Um, how how is how is it shifting in a in a positive direction? And what are some of the opportunities that that come your way? How do you feel about the demands of social media? which is one of the new aspects of the industry now, and, um, and where are some of the problems going to be? You see, um, anyone? Oh, I'll, I'll, <coughs> excuse me, I'll start. Um, I can call on you, Rory, because I, I was afraid I was challenging your voice. Go I know. Um, no, well, water I, behind you. It's, the water doesn't help. I had a lot of it, um, but thank you. I, um, because I'm doing this film on women in Hollywood, what we have found is that in, in these new mediums um, and, and outlet opportunities that, that women are uh, exploring those uh, much more aggressively and that it seems like those outlets are allowing for much more opportunity that women are succeeding in. Um, so I, I'm very excited about, about those opportunities that that exist and women's role in them. And even, even in television right now, women are doing a lot better than they are in like Hollywood theatrical releases. Um, but also with the internet and, and other outlets available, women are, are thriving in those areas. Anyone else? A few things on the, I would say on the bad side, I have to say budgets are shrinking terrible. I have to say it's not, it's not pretty out there financially. Um, on some of the bright notes, um, I would say, um, there's a new thing. I think the distribution model is crumbling. I think the film industry is facing what the music industry has faced with piracy um, and so on. And um, and just distribution sort of rethink. Uh, of one of the good things I think that's emerging is um, uh, self-distribution is losing its stigma. Um, one of the things we did on the crash, we did lots of innovative things, and it's a really interesting case study that I should write up sometime. One of the things we did was we reserved the right to sell directly from our website in all territories. And what we're doing is working with a company called Topspin, highly recommended. There's a few other companies also doing good stuff in that space, where they've helped mentor us to build a kind of shop on our store front on our website where we sell packages 
of fan star fan experiences or stickers or DVD extras or whatnot that fans can purchase the film there where we make better um, uh, returns and also um, you know we, we can sell a package of you know go skiing with Kevin Pierce for a thousand dollars for example and then also people won't go to the bit torrents and pirate it one of the things with crash we had a big we have many demographics one of our audience demographics is young people who don't respect piracy very much <laughs> or priv you know, copyright very much so we wanted to you know if we can sell them a fan experience they'll come to us and buy the film otherwise they'll just um, you know get it for free because they can and so you know that sell direct model where you also build and I think also we're learning to think of ourselves as brands brand Lucy Walker um, LucyWalkerFilm.com at LucyWalkerFilm on Twitter LucyWalkerFilm at Gmail you know we're a brand I am um, uh, owning my own and hopefully building a, an email list imagine if John Waters had an email list of his fans I had lunch with him in Provincetown Film Festival recently the guy's broke and doesn't know how to raise money for his wonderful films if he had an email list of fans he could do a Kickstarter campaign that would be splendid or easily just email his fans and somehow raise money and then he'd own his own project or he'd even be getting rights you know, if he withheld, held, if he owned any part of his projects, he'd still be getting some kind of profit share now. And it's kind of, you know, I think in future we, we want to be thinking smart. How can we earn money? And 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 so sort of thinking about um, trying to build an email database, work with social media. I um, think Twitter has actually been super helpful. On the downside, of course, I'm sure it's wrecking my concentration and mind. You're very good at it, Lucy. <laughs> at Lucy Walker Film, please tweet me, etc. And uh, it was one other thing on the bright side: impact. I think documentaries is a really evolving science. Um, there's impact and outreach, and you know, learning how to leverage the film for you know in important causes and and activations and finding your audience. I think we're really kind of learning. There's a lot of stuff we're learning, and a lot of um, stuff, and also social media gurus like Picture Motion, really good company, mentored us in social media, creating memes, for example, nice pictures from the film with nice quotes that you stick on Facebook and people share the crap out of them. Who knew, right? So that stuff is we've. Is that where Love Your Brain came from? No, Love Your Brain was a. I, I coined it for a kind of. It's our outreach campaign around brain injury and, and awareness and, and um, prevention uh, that we've really had a great time doing with um, the Crash Reel was um, Love Your Brain campaign has been hugely successful, I'm hugely proud of. It's a sort of separate, you know, the film is not an activist advocacy film, it's really a verite sort of a film. But we had these things that really bugged me. You know, kids are being killed doing these sports, and they're not even insured, and they're not wearing helmets. How do we change that? Well, we get infographics about what to do if you hit your head. We challenge the organizers to, to get the, the kids insured. We get insurance information to athletes. We do we, lots of things for brain injury, survivors, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, check out our website, thecrashreel.com, and, and there's a whole Love Your Brain section on there. And it was really fun and kind of time consuming, but incredibly rewarding. So that outreach stuff, I think, for documentaries is state of the art and, and good pitch and Brit Dark and you know, Bertha, you know, all those, what are they called? The Impact Puma Impact Award. It's a really evolving sort of art, and I think it's t teaching us a lot about how we can get these documentaries out there in a new and, and really important way. An engaging way. All right, we do have time for a couple of questions. Raise your hand. Um, we have a mic. Um, you go put ahead. this mic up, I'll. Hi. Um, so we just successfully funded a feature film, which we'll be shooting this summer. It's our first, I'm directing it. Um, but we had a kind of a interesting thing happen. We ran on a platform that was a film for women, women by women, and we're using an entirely female crew. And this is my producing partner, and she had a guy friend write to her and say, you can't do that, it's sexist. And I'm wondering how, what your response is to that. It's like, we can't win. <laughs> you know? I, I how good a friend is he? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. You can do whatever you want. It, 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 and it's not taking anything away from him for, for you to do that. Uh, you know, there's a similar situation when a friend of mine has this organization called Black Girls Rock, and people were really upset about it. Well, what about everybody else? And there was a whole White Girls Rock 2 thing that happened, and she was like, I'm not telling you you don't rock. I'm just saying that we rock. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And so here's the situation where there needs to be opportunities for women. You're women in positions of power, and you're using it. Do not allow him to take that away from you're, you. You're, just, you're making choices. You're yes. choosing the best people that you want to work with <laughs> who share your vision to tell your story. It's interesting to try it out. Yeah, it's nice, though, because you... 
that's what happens when you try stuff out. You learn stuff. And you if he wants to volunteer his time and help you out, <laughs> great. He could be the co-DP. He could be the additional camera. Or he could bring you coffee. There's also a whole set of statistics. Oh, there's a set of statistics that came out that are really interesting. Um, that they, um, is that Stacey Smith as well? There's a really important set of statistics that came out that when women are behind the camera, more women are hired in other key positions. And also how women are depicted on screen is different. And the stats on women on screen are as shocking and egregious and outrageous as the stats. There's something like, you know, when uh, teenage um, girls are depicted on screen, it's 50% scantily clad or naked in sexual roles, stuff like that. And when women are behind the scenes, it's different. I just think, what message are we... Um, and violence, too. And violence, too. What are we... And how are women depicted? Like, oh, attra uh, how many attractive women over 40, etc.? You know, the whole way the world is skewed when women aren't behind the camera, and it's so important we change it. In a documentary, what stories are being told, how they're being told, new stories that can be told. You know, I don't know whether the crash reel was because I'm a female that I made the most anti-action sports, action sports movie ever, but could have been. You know, I have a different perspective that hasn't been seen in that world before, and it's so encouraging, exciting and encouraging that you're doing it. It's great. Go ahead. Stephanie Spaulding, and I am a professor of women's and ethnic studies. And I, I notice when we tend to have panels like this, we, we talk about um, sexuality, gender, or race separately. And my question, it, not, it came up a little bit in regards to your personal experience, but in relationship to masculine response and support within the industry, how does race impact that? And how, how does the, the whiteness of masculinity might impact the kind of uh, industry dynamics that happen? That, <laughs> that, that, that is a thesis question right there. But I mean, I, I really think that, listen, we're in a business, and the people with power, you have to know who they are. Often they are white men. They're the, fu the ones funding. Sometimes they're women on the dock side. And so knowing, you have to know somebody and know how to navigate those waters. Because you walking in, you're going to be assumed to be x, y, and z. There's that, that calculus that we all do. And so my attitude towards it is like, if I know that that's going to happen, then this, these are the ways in which I combat it, or I work around it, or I circumvent it. Uh, an example would be, I had, for the Free Angela documentary, I had a meeting with um, some ball players. And I just knew I was going to walk into the room, their hotel, they were like, come to my hotel room. <laughs> this is where we do meetings. And, um, I, but I had to take the opportunity. So I brought a friend of mine um, who had executive produced on my previous film about Shirley Chisholm. He's tall and he's male. Do you know we walked into that room and everybody talked to him like he was the director? Because I looked too much like a lot of the women that were hanging out around there. So, but I knew enough that if I was going to have this meeting, that I, was, I needed to take a man. And so I used my beards. You know, we do what we need to do. This is why we need allies. We need networking. We need to know how to get what we want, no matter what. <laughs> so we're going to wrap this up. Judith, did you have something oh, you I wanted did. to I add? Just, I wanted to add on a positive note. I mean, not that we haven't been positive, but. I, I just want to say, I think that like Chicken and Egg Pictures, um, like the Sundance Labs and the Sundance Documentary Fund, and, and Bertha Brit Docs, and Cine Reach, and Good Pitch, and um, Fireside Media, and all of these different, and you know, Cartemquin, there's all these different institutions. Some have been around for decades, some have been around for almost a decade, some are relatively new. All, each one of us started, I mean, we started our women's initiative, you call it that, because as filmmakers, we actually knew exactly what was wrong and what was missing, and we weren't waiting, we weren't waiting for a study. We just figured, you know what, women really are missing a certain kind of access. They're missing startup funds. They're missing like that little thing that enables them to green light themselves so they could jump and they could go and they could take some risks. And we should try to take risks with them rather than on them. And there's really not enough spaces like HBO, or like the places where you get to actually fail forward with extraordinary executives who make a very safe place for you to, to sort of work and ask lots of questions. And there's so many of us that are trying to create those institutions, safe spaces where that can happen. And it's a pretty generous space. So I, I, feel, I do really do feel pretty confident that um, 
we are making um, we are making much better opportunities for each other and for the field and for more women and for more men um, who don't necessarily have the access and know the right people to get the access and know the right people. Thank you all so much. It If you want to follow up on some of the topics discussed today, you can go to Twitter, look for hashtag DocWomen. Also, uh, I think excerpts of this panel will eventually be on Anne's uh, website at IndieWire.com, the Thompson on Hollywood blog. Thank you all for coming. Thanks especially to these great directors.